of our ongoing study on dispensations, seasons, and times. And this is based on the revelation the Lord began to give in 1996, 24 years ago this past August. And the Lord began to speak concerning the sad state of Africa and its offsprings worldwide. You know, some of the, uh, uh, the letters of Paul, there were some of them where he addressed the Jews as a people. There was lamentation in Africa in our time when we were growing up. The abject poverty, the crisis, the coups, the instabilities, and all these things, it was like, Father, will Africa suffer in the present only to go into, the million, only to go into eternity suffering? And the Lord began to speak words of hope. I said, look, I have a plan for Africa and its children. His children across the world, Africa, America, the Caribbean and West Indies, his children in Europe, his children, you know, in Asia and the Middle East. I have, a, I have a plan, but that plan is based on a divine program. And what we're discussing in this course is to understand the intersection of the Bible and history. And what the Lord has said, most of them have happened. Most of them have happened. And there are some that are too sensitive to talk about, and he has not given release to talk about, so we won't talk about them. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is saying that we got to understand that there is hope for all branches of the human family. Elohim is an Elohim of equity. And his justice is balanced by his mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. And so today we're going to be on talking about a little bit more about understanding and applying the concept of kingdom in our walk with Yeshua, which the Lord wanted the church out of the land of Ham, out of the loins of Ham. You know, I mean, listen, brethren, let's not be more righteous than Elohim. For instance, Elohim divided the world into two, Jews and Gentiles. And the church, as it is, is the church out of the Gentiles. And this morning the Lord reminded me through a post 10 years ago in Jeremiah that the new covenant is a new covenant Elohim made with Israel. And you know what it means? The Gentiles were brought into that covenant by the blood of Yeshua. The Lord still recognizes heritage, roots, but the only thing is that the Lord has provided for the blood of the Lamb to sanctify every root and make us one new man, his original plan. Because all of us hail from Noah, all of us hail from Adam and Eve. But then there are what they call dispensations of the gospel committed to the trust of people. And those who resist the dispensations are resisting Elohim himself, who by election makes the choice. This is a little bit deep. You know, I admit, but the truth is dispensations. There are things you cannot explain. Why the Lord would choose a particular person for something? Why the Lord would do a work of grace? He would do in a particular uh, family or ministry? You think it's by the strength of the family or ministry? No, it is election at work. So the Lord had chosen that Africa and its offsprings who had suffered the slave trade, suffered degradation, suffered demonization, suffered all manner of profiling, that that poverty, that in extreme, you know, disfigurement, so to say, of history, that it will be the very instrument or the very factor the Lord is going to use to do what he wants to use worldwide through his children from that lineage. And today, I just want to tell you one aspect of it and break it down by the Spirit and we trust that the Lord will enable us to catch the revelation. Heavenly Father, we have nothing to say but only that which your Spirit has given. Therefore, Lord, we surrender to you. Speak expressly your word and grant us understanding. Let there be no one cherry-picking these things, but let's understand a holistic concept, and even now, speak to us in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. And so, brothers and sisters, in the course of history, the sons of Shem took the blessing, it's worked for them. Before you see a poor Jew across the world, it's difficult. Even from a residual point of view, that 
even though they've not been redeemed, they've not accepted the redemption and the blood, just by walking on the Abrahamic covenant, is worked for them in all areas where they are. Let a Jew enter a community, give him 10 years, there's a transformation. It's a mantle. It's worked. Anyone denying it, that's why people are jealous. Nations are jealous. Tribes are jealous. Races are jealous. But it's unfortunate for those who are jealous because they're there to hold on to what Elohim told Abraham, the patriarch of the race. Brothers and sisters, what are the sons of Japheth? Japheth's sons have walked in the blessing that they receive residually. That today, it doesn't matter how educated or non-educated, the typical person with the blood of Japheth in the veins is organized, respects time, is able to, to, to figure things out, you know, plan, pro plan, organize, and get there over a period of time. And as I told you, that great thing has also worked negatively in the area of religion because it was what led the sons of Japheth to turn the gospel of the kingdom to religion in Europe and exported it worldwide because the frontier spirit is upon the, 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 the sons of Japheth. That's why you hardly find the son of Japheth stay one place. They're always looking for new places where the gold rush is, where there's money to be made, where there's prosperity to be made. And it's worked for them across the world. But look at what the look at the deal. That that very blessings that the sons of Shem and Japhet have walked in is the very thing that have made them to put their back to Elohim because with the prosperity, with the goodness, with everything working for them, if you walk into a bank to look for a loan, you have a Japhetic uh, color, Japhetic blood, you are, your loan will be considered most likely. Before the one from the land of Ham is considered, is very difficult. You have to prove yourself with so many things before. You know what? Those very blessings have become the instruments of making people not to see their need of Elohim. Everything seems to work. Civilization seems to work. They are not going to want to go to Venus, want to go to Mars, want to go to the sun and all that, want to explore the sun. These things have become the very things that have made the man to use the mind to figure out things. And in that state, there is not much room for Elohim. Then with the Big Bang Theory that the world came by, you know, the Big Bang is how creation came. And by evolution theory, these two theories have done the damage. And that is the basis why Elohim said, my program in the earth dream, I'm not going to allow it to be totally destroyed because some of my sons who have walked in the blessings they received from Noah have not figured me out. And that's the basis in which he went to the house of Ham. To call for himself a people. And he's not calling them to go and do African church stuff. You know, you see today all kinds of funny things in the name of church. He's not calling them to go and become Nimrodic leaders over the people. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Yeshua said, I hate it. You don't conquer people and subdue them and own them. So he said, no. I've called them for something. That in that stage... Where they've come from down under, come from this, you know, come from rejection, come from enslavement, come from so many issues. I've not called them to be angry and burn down and, and rage and protest and offense against everything. That's not what I call them. I call them to understand something that churchianity forgot. And what is it? The gospel of the kingdom. The original gospel that Yeshua preached demonstrated and commissioned his church because in Matthew 24, 14, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations and then shall the end come. In other words, the return of the Lord has been referenced on this scripture that there's a gospel that needs to be preached. Churchianity has been preached. Christian religion has been preached. It's made people twice the sons of hell. Christian religion has led people to elevate the building as church, elevate the denomination as church, and so division has been inherent. But the Lord didn't give us Christian religion to preach. We know that, listen, in Antioch, people saw the way 
believers were living. You know what they were called before? People of the way. The way. Which way? The way of Yeshua. The way he trod. People knew them as saints called out of the world. People knew them as, you know, they had another king. They had another kingdom. It was at Antioch. People looked at, wow, these people look at that man. And so, because Greek was the predominant language, the word Messiah in Greek means Christos, the anointed one. That's what it means. So they say Christians, Christos people, people who look like him. Brothers and sisters, that nickname should not in any way blind us for the reality that we are kingdom citizens and ambassadors. We are the saints of the Most High. And the Lord wants us to understand that he has committed as a dispensation of the gospel to his sons out of harm, out of rejection, out of the place of being put aside, being on the margins of history. The Lord wants them to be people who can understand the gospel of the kingdom and proclaim it. And so the question is, what is it about the gospel of the kingdom that we need to understand? Number one, it speaks of a king who is supreme. Every kingdom, natural, spiritual, is centered on one, a king who is supreme, a supreme ruler, a potentate. In our own case, Yeshua is not just to be presented as Savior who died for you on the cross to live your life any way you want, take you to heaven when you go. No, but in this present life, the deal of the Christian faith, which is kingdom life, is that you do not truly become who you ought to be until the day you make a value decision that whereas you were ruling yourself before or Satan was ruling through the mindset or culture, the day you come to the realization that there's a king knocking at the door of your heart, you open the door of your heart and allow him to sit on the throne of your heart to exercise sovereign rule as ruler of life in every department, everything about your future, everything about your present, everything about your life is committed to him and you bow before him. He exercises sovereign rule. This is the heart of the gospel. Check all the people of Yeshua, Peter, James, John, all of them. This is what made it possible for them to live the way they live. It's what made it possible for them to seal their testimony in blood. Because whatever the king wanted, so let it be. The word of the king is power. So as Holy Spirit led them into the will of the king, they just bowed. So the Lord wants to use his children from Africa to restore the concept of Yeshua as king, reigning king now, and king who will come one day to rule over the earth. And if he doesn't rule in your heart today, he will not guarantee you a portion in the world to come. That's so important. Number two, kingdom speaks of domain. A domain is the physical scope or sphere of the realm of the king. Another way of saying the geographical extent of territory that makes up the kingdom. So, Psalm 24 tells us the earth is the loss and the fullness thereof. We are told that everything was created by him. So the earth is his domain. And brothers and sisters, a lot of people mix up domain and dominion. I'm going to come to dominion in a moment. Domain just has to do with the extent of territory. Let me give you an example. The Queen of England, Her Majesty Elizabeth II, is a queen whose domain includes England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. These four make up United Kingdom. These four kingdoms. These four spheres of the realm make up the United Kingdom. But that's not all. She's like no other monarch on earth. She is like no one else. She's also the Queen of Canada, a G20 nation. She's the Queen of Australia. She's the Queen of Jamaica. She's the Queen of New Zealand. She's the Queen of some of the island nations of the world. Her realm extends to that place. That's her domain. So the, every king has a domain. And the earth and its fullness is a domain. He created it. True that because of Satan's work, when he took away the mantle of rulership from 
Adam, he became the God of this world in the sense of influencing. Because on this wall that we have, on this earth, one earth, there are two walls. There's the world that is ruled by the king of kings. There's also the world ruled by Satan, those who have refused the rulership of the king. It doesn't matter whether you go to church. If he's not ruling on the throne of your heart, you are in danger. So the domain, to now begin to see this earth as a lord. So you're a kingdom citizen and ambassador. Anywhere he sends you, that's the essence of Acts 1.8. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the most part of the earth. Anywhere he sends you, don't be like a stranger. Don't go and allow oh, your skin color, uh, they will discriminate against you. Who told you? You are an ambassador of the king. We're going to come to that also. Number three, the kingdom speaks of dominion. Now, this is the interesting part. Domain is territory. Dominion refers to those who the king is ruling over. And this is why it's so important that you must enthrone Yeshua as king over your life, sovereign rule over your life, because that is the evidence that you are part of his dominion. He rules your life. If he doesn't rule your life in the present, he will not guarantee you a place in the world to come. To the sons of Elohim from the lineage of Shem is committed to preach this truth. And that's why Satan did a terrible thing. You see, Satan can peep. He peeped and saw what was committed to the sons of Elohim from uh, uh, Hamitic origin, and he tried to corrupt the message of the kingdom through Hamitic people, part of them, in our lifetime. In our lifetime, one rose from the Caribbean and told people, don't preach Jesus, preach the kingdom, preach the power, the glory, the wealth of the kingdom, don't preach Jesus. That error, that heresy swept through the world that today, even though he's no longer alive, his works have influenced some people and some people still believe that lie that he can preach a kingdom without the king. It's not done. It's not done. His is the kingdom. The power and the glory. He is the center and circumference of the kingdom. You can't put him aside. Anything you place ahead of the king is an idol. And it's not tenable in the kingdom. So the Lord expects us to allow him to be enthroned in our heart. That way we become his dominion. And when we are his dominion, our life is hidden within him. His name is a strong tower. We run into him, we are safe. When we are his dominion, listen. We are secure in him and the Father, sealed by Holy Spirit. Nothing can touch us. When we are his dominion, then we can tap into the fullness of his benefits as king. And so that is why the key to becoming his dominion is discipleship. For he says in Matthew 16, 24 to 25, Then said Yeshua unto his disciples, If any man, he doesn't force you, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And that's what Galatians 2.20 now tells us. The example of Paul, I am crucified with Yeshua, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Yeshua liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so, that's the key. To be his dominion is to submit to his sovereign rule. And when that happens, you have moved from being a believer to become a disciple. Number four, every kingdom has a constitution. Constitution is a rule book, the guidebook that describes, you know, the, the, the powers of the king, the uh, responsibility of the king towards us, the citizens, our own responsibility as citizens towards the king, the way to live so that we can walk in culture of the kingdom, all those things articulated. And the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, rightly divided, provides the constitution of the kingdom. So anybody who says, oh, I'm a, I believe in, uh, I'm, a, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a kingdom citizen, and you do cherry pick the scriptures, you are committing sedition. If the war doesn't rule you, you are none of his. Because if you love me, obey me. Obey my commandments. So, the constitution is something we need to intentionally study, understand, and allow to be engrafted into us. So, it's no longer external. No longer something we're going to struggle, but it becomes a very life through which 
We are led by Holy Spirit. That's what we're told in Colossians 3. Let the, light, let, let the word of Yeshua dwell in us richly in all wisdom. So that as we meditate upon the word, the word sinks in. And as it sinks in, it transforms our heart, renews our mind, and we begin to live it out in day-to-day -day life. Brothers and sisters, number five thing about every kingdom is that it has ambassadors. Ambassadors who represent the king in the court of other kings. They carry the name of the king. They carry the person of the king. They carry the glory of the king. They carry the sovereignty of their nation. And where they live becomes an embassy of that kingdom. For instance, the American ambassador to the court of St. James, Buckingham Palace, the American ambassador, where he lives, he represents President Trump, he represents the nation of America. Even if you were thief and murderer, armed robber, and you ran past the gate into the compound. The Metropolitan Police of London cannot cross the gate to arrest you because you are right there into the territory. If that territory is just three plus, four plus, five plus, ten plus together, one hectare together, that very place is United States of America in London. You cannot enter there. So we are ambassadors of the king. We are carriers of his presence and his glory. That's why we told us in Acts 1, 8, that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, in uttermost parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit we receive is our ambassadorial credential. Every ambassador presents a credential. Those who are appointed to the United Kingdom, they, are, they don't answer ambassadors. They carry a letter from, say, the State Department, declaring that His Excellency, the President of the Nation, has appointed you to represent the United States of America in the Court of St. James. That letter, the day Her Majesty the Queen stretches her hand on an appointment and receives you, shakes your hand, you don't stretch your hand to the Queen. No, you wait to her. She stretches her hand, you shake it and give her the letter. That is what you call presenting letters of credence. Once you present that letter of credence, after that short ceremony, you turn back. You are now His Excellency so and so, the ambassador of that nation to this land. When you get to your car, if there are, if there are soldiers or police there, they salute you. And when you go driving, if there is a, a traffic light, you can ride across. Nobody will give you a ticket. Nobody will give you a ticket because you now have diplomatic immunity. Brothers and sisters, Holy Spirit in us is our ambassadorial credential. We have diplomatic immunity from some of the laws of nature, some of the things of the world, earth, dream. And if we walk in the conscience of that, we'll know why miracles, signs, and wonders should be a normal lifestyle. Because we are representing the kingdom of heaven wherever we are planted and in our spheres of influence. Brothers and sisters, number six, every kingdom has a culture. Culture is a lifestyle of the kingdom, based on the nature of the king, based on provisions in the world. The culture of the kingdom of heaven is a culture of righteousness, which is right standing with the Father on the merit of the blood that Yeshua shed. Number two is a culture of holiness unto the Lord. We are separate from evil. We are consecrated to him. It's a culture of love. Love is a commandment the Lord gave us in John 13, 34, 35. It's a new commandment to love as he loves. We are the only people on earth who live not for ourselves but for others. Who in our prayer life, in everything we do, we are seeking how we can be a blessing to other people. That is the nature of the kingdom, the nature of love. Self selfishness is not permitted in the kingdom. The kingdom is a selfless kingdom. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Then we're a kingdom of unity. We are united. It doesn't matter where you are. All who are seeking the Lord this way, we are one and we have a duty to walk in unity, to walk in alignment. And then the Lord in his own way, just as there are 12 tribes of Israel, are 12 disciples, the Lord brings alignment among all that is his kingdom. He puts them into kingdom families. You discover some shared values that you pursue and you stand with each other. Number five is a kingdom of service also. We are called to serve others, not to be served. 
Matthew 20, 20 to 28, the kingdom, the king established that ordinance. We also a kingdom of justice and equity. Justice is balanced by equity. And the Lord wants us to be people who do justice, who do equity. People who are fair. Then number seven, the kingdom has an economic system. The world economic system is based on some terrible principles. One of the principles is this. Listen to this. In the world economics, whether it's Adam Smith or Milton Keynes or any other economist in the world, the entire economic system of the world is based on this principle. Resources of the world are depleting and population of the world is exploding. And in this state, there's a rat race of everybody basically to get as much as you can for yourself and for generations to come. It leads to competition. It leads to strife. It leads to pulling him down syndrome. But the culture of the kingdom, economic culture of the kingdom is based on a different paradigm. And that is the one who created us. He knows how many we are. And he has the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the El Shaddai. He's Jehovah Jireh. He has enough for everybody. The sky is too wide. that two beds cannot collide in the kingdom. Two destinies cannot collide. We should be able to affirm each other, bless each other, promote each other. We should be able to look for opportunities for each other. We should be able to do that with joy because the economic system of the kingdom, there's enough for everyone. So we got to dumb poverty mentality that afflicted the sons of harm because of the poverty of the old and there you see people they are just thinking of themselves no we have to serve other people the economic system elohim has enough for all of us number eight the kingdom has an econ- educational system in the holy scriptures the educational system is so clear if we study it intently and make it the foundation of everything we do we are going to live lives that will fulfill destiny if we go by the scripture, check you know, things like, you know, you want to have peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost, which is part of our kingdom culture, then you must learn to avoid strife. You must learn that even if somebody slaps you, leave me alone. So the educational system, if we teach the children early, the educational system of the kingdom, they go through life with that system and they're going to overcome. They are going to be above. Daniel knew the educational system of the kingdom. So he proposed in his heart he will not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. And so Daniel, even though he didn't eat the king's meat, was found wiser than others. Number nine, the kingdom has a reward and punishment system. Every kingdom has a reward system, has a punishment system. Reward when you obey the laws and and when you disobey and break the laws, punishment, so also in the kingdom. In this present life, the law rewards you for obedience. In this present kingdom, in this present part of life, if you walk in disobedience, you're going to get some of the pains and knocks, but above all, there's an ultimate reward to spend eternity with Elohim. After spending 1,000 years millionaire with Yeshua, to spend eternity with him forever, and for those who reject his rulership, eternal damnation with Satan in the lake of fire and brimstone. So brothers and sisters, we need to now understand that that's the framework. There are some other things. We don't have time to talk about it. So if we understand that kingdom now is when the king reigns in our heart, we will understand the power that is embedded in every saint. Because when he reigns in our heart, he's able to push back the frontier of darkness. The reason why the Antichrist has not manifested is the church. But today in our time, as the religious church predominates, the mystery of iniquity is exploding. The culture of iniquity, sin, lies, strife, fear, confusion, chaos, look at it across the world. Brothers and sisters, is our light. The light of the king in us that is beaten by the frontier of darkness. That is why the day the church is raptured, the next will be the Antichrist will manifest. The Antichrist is going to be on edge and will not be known. The presence of the church will still make it possible for, you know, you know whatever he does to be in secret 
And maybe only few people will know that this is the pathway of him to come. So brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know that for now, he has called us to occupy. He has called us to occupy until he comes. He's going to come back. So in this present time, we are to occupy. We are to proclaim the kingdom. We are going to tell others. We are going to be instruments of recruiting into the kingdom. Those who are ordained for salvation, but they are yet outside. Because they are, they, the Lord's plan is to use us to reconcile them to him. And when we do that, we need to understand that Satan never changes. The same way he took away the kingdom from Adam and Eve is the same way he's still exercising till today. How did he take away the kingdom from Adam and Eve? He used the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what is in Genesis chapter 3. The same thing Satan tried against Yeshua in Matthew chapter 4. And that's the same thing he's using today. The lust of the eyes, what people see. That's why the television people, they spend a lot of money to give to creative people who are going to create a 30 seconds ad, a commercial that the moment it flashes in 30 seconds, it puts something in you and makes you want it. So it activates covetousness to have what the Lord didn't want you for. And so lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, desiring things that are illegal, that are illegitimate, things that are not in the plan of the Lord for his people, and people are just desiring and yearning for it, and the same thing he tried with Adam and Eve, that's what he's trying to today. That's why the Lord wants us to know that he wants his church out of the land of Ham to come to a place where it is no longer preaching churchianity, it comes to a place where people are challenged. It's not enough to say, I'm a believer, you live anyhow. And that is why it is a terrible thing. What you see in the land of Ham, go to Africa today. Are you talking about West Africa? Mm. East Africa? Mm. South Africa? Mm. You see people gather people around, promote themselves as the solution provider. People are gathering for them. They don't know Elohim, but they know the man of God. They know the man of God. Service will start three, four, five hours at a stretch. No preaching, no teaching. It's just about miracles, miracles, signs, wonders, prophecy. And people are just dig, milk drinking babes. The sons of Ham, the Lord is saying to you, if you continue that way, you are simply creating new Nimrods who own the people. And that's why all kinds of things are happening. And the Lord is saying, if you understand the gospel of the kingdom, we're going to emulate John the Baptist, who in Matthew chapter, in John chapter 3 from verse 29, he said, he who has the bridegroom, who had the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standed and heareth him, rejoiced greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaker of the earth, he that cometh from heaven is above all. So John the Baptist deliberately decreased and promoted Yeshua, promoted Yeshua, so that the people could receive him. And the Lord is saying to all pastors, all those who have their roots in the land of Ham, give up ownership of the people, give up control of the people, point them to the king, point them to the master, and encourage them, challenge them. Don't just come to church as in a building. Don't just come on certain holy days. You gather around and jump up and jump down. Get to open your heart. Embrace the king. Let him rule. Let him be sovereign ruler. When we do that, you know what? The people begin to walk in signs and wonders. They actually don't need us. For certain realms of signs and wonders, because the name of Yeshua is still powerful in itself. The blood of Yeshua is still powerful in itself. That is why kingdom citizens empower people through the teach, train, equip, activate, release paradigm. And you know what? Those the Lord has ordained to walk with you as a leader, they will come with you, they will connect with you, they will abide with you, and they will collaborate with you. And if they are those that the Lord has not ordained, they go. Praise the Lord. Let them expand the kingdom. And brothers and sisters, the gospel of the kingdom does not project the leaders. It projects Yeshua. And when people embrace him this way and become his disciples, they are ready to do anything he leads them anytime. And brothers and sisters, this is the true gospel that needs to be restored. And the Lord says, I've chosen 
my children from the neglected branch of the human family. This is the pathway to their own exaltation in the program of the Lord. And it's through this gospel that the one new man of Elohim shall arise. Because whether you are from the root of Shem, the root of Japheth, the root of Ham, when you hear this gospel, this gospel transforms life from inside out. And then the identity of the believer is on Yeshua within, the hope of glory. And the world renews the mind, takes away the African mindset, African-American mindset, Caribbean mindset, a European-African mindset, and replaces it with the mind of Yeshua. It does so also with the house of Shem. And it does so with the house of Japheth. And so those who have received this dealing of the spirit and of the word and of the blood, these people, they are the one new man. And that is what the Lord is walking towards. That's the direction. And the Lord is saying to us, are you not seeing the glorious plan of the Lord? I will you not embrace it and decrease so that he may increase. By way of assignment today, number one, what ironic thing makes the church in Africa particularly suited to preach and teach the full gospel of the kingdom? What is that irony? Remember what I told you at the beginning. Others have been blessed and Africa and his offspring seem to have been, you know, in poverty, in all that, and they are seeking a Messiah who is king indeed. And through this, all, all these things can come. Number two, please explain these kingdom concepts briefly. King, domain, dominion, constitution, ambassador, culture. Explain them. These six. Three, what new thing did you learn from this lesson? Brothers and sisters, the Father loves us, and the Father will never forsake us. Having said that, I just want to make some announcements now. Let me pray first. Father, I pray that your children, this world will challenge them to give up churchianity and Christian religion because they are not profitable and to embrace the gospel of the kingdom and enthrone Yeshua as king in our hearts. That he will rule and reign through us to your own glory and praise, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, this Friday, the 12-day global kingdom prayer and fast begins. Friday 18th, and it runs all through till Tuesday 29th. And by the grace of the Lord, I just want to encourage every one of us who is part of this uh, 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 teaching to be part of it. And if you cannot for any reason do all the all the days, don't feel bad. We we'll say to you, you can do three main days. Three main days. Number one, Friday, when we start. Number two, the day assigned to your uh, your country. And number three, twenty sixth, twenty sixth of September. Now, by the grace of the Lord. The, it is interesting. One of the most significant Jewish days, holy holy days, is Rosh Hashanah, and that's this very weekend. Rosh Hashanah is from Friday sundown all the way to Sunday. You know, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the month Elul is ending, and is going to lead to Tishrei, and that is the beginning, the head of the year. Rosh Hashanah is head of the year. It was the time that the Jews remembered that the world was created by Elohim. So it's the bad day of the world and the bad day of the creation of man, Adam, according to the Jewish New Year, according to the Jewish calendar. And I told you the other day that the Romans led by Julius Caesar gave the world a Julian calendar and it was finished up by Pope Gregory who gave the Gregorian calendar that today, the world has no more consciousness of the calendar Elohim and the Jews walked in. So Rosh Hashanah is this weekend. And what it means is new beginnings. The old is ending, the new is starting. And in the spiritual realm, the Lord wants his saints to know. There's a new dispensation. Over the next six months, certain things will happen. Various vessels have seen so many things. Crises confusion, strife, things that look like terrible situations you can't think of, happening in some areas you never think of in the world. The reason is that there's a new atmosphere 
And there's a new dispensation rising in the air trim that has to do with the end time. And so the best thing is for every believer, make your calling and election sure. Soak yourself in the blood and fix on his work. Fix on his work and keep on with his work. Occupy till he comes. But watch and pray. So, 2018 this weekend, if you can join us, let us know so that we can have anywhere you are. Prayer points have been released. So, you pick them up. Pray on your own. Pray on your own. We're going to still release it in more Facebook groups today. Pray on your own each of the days. But on, on Friday, we're going to end with a Zoom prayer rally. And it is going to be by 10 p.m. London time, which is 11 p.m. South African time, which is 5 p.m. Eastern time and 4 p.m. Central time on this Friday. So also on 26th, the same will happen. Okay? And for the nations... For USA, Canada, and Mexico, North America, is is Saturday 19th, 20th, Sunday, Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, St. Vincent and Grandas, Bahamas, St. Lucia, Barbados, and those nations, Kitts and St. Nevis, that was the Sunday. 21st, which is Monday, UK, Israel, France, Germany, Russia, United Nations, European Union, Saudi Arabia, Iran, North Korea. 22nd, Tuesday, in Ireland and Italy, uh, 23rd, Oceania, Australia, Fiji Island, Tonga, 24th, Nigeria, the ECOWAS, and African Union, 25th, Liberia, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, 26th, the Global Day of Prayer, 27th, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Lesotho, Angola, and those nations there, 28th, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, DRC, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and the other nations in the area, and 29th, UAE, Middle East, Asia, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, they will pray on that day. So, check the days. Please join us to pray. Let's pray in one accord. Let's also renounce anti-Semitism. Renounce the replacement theology because there's no such thing let's renounce them all because they've led to christians doing wicked acts against israel and let's rediscover our roots in what the lord gave to israel and let's pray for israel pray for salvation both spiritually and physical security let's also be people who pray the prayer points cover a wide spectrum of things almost 29 prayer points let's join in and the Lord will use the prayers of the saints. And even if it's you are the only one in your community, in your city, in your state, in your nation, according to Jeremiah 5 verse 1 and Ezekiel 22 30, even one person standing in the gap, the Lord can use you to save your people, to do great exploits. We're going to have the bad days later, and we want to say thank you so much, elect, for being with us on the camera. The Lord bless you all.